thoughts, right? Because sometimes with research, you know, you can get so carried away with your own thoughts and ideas that your research priorities might no longer reflect the priorities of the people you're you're supposedly serving. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 177 of the Stroke Cast. This episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash modus Nova. This week's guest is Dr. Aravin Ganesh from Colavidence. Colavidence is basically, it's a Kickstarter for neurological research. And here's why that matters. You see, there is a lot of stroke research happening, but it's still not enough. I mean, given the prevalence and the impact of stroke and how widespread it is across all countries in the world, we need scientists to do even more work on prevention, on acute treatment, and on recovery. Many of us are alive today because of the research done in the past. And many of us nearly didn't make it because the medical teams did not know as much as we would have liked them to know at the time. And many of us still want to continue recovering and reacquiring abilities. New research can help medical teams learn to help us more. And yet, not all the research needs to be multi-million dollar multi-site studies, or at least not in the early stages of it. Smaller proof-of-concept studies can help identify things that could work and can inform even bigger studies down the road. And that's where collaborative comes in. By crowdsourcing funding and expertise for a diverse assortment of research projects from around the world, it democratizes and opens up funding models while ensuring new or alternative ideas get the rigor and consideration that could bring, you know, transformational techniques into modern medicine, or even just show what doesn't work so we don't waste any more time or money on it. By expanding the research resources available, training the next generation of researchers, and opening up research opportunities to folks around the world, from developed to developing nations, Collavidence has the potential to make our lives and the lives of our loved ones that much better. So now, let's learn more about Collavidence and how it works by meeting Dr. Aravind Ganesh. So Aravind, thank you so much for joining us on the show this week. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. This is a really interesting uh, platform, as I, I talked about in the intro. Uh, I want to start with sort of the mission of the platform, which is that Collavidence brings together dynamic review and precision funding to make medical research more efficient, inclusive, and impactful. So what does that mean? Well, uh, one of the uh, challenges that that we noticed as physicians and researchers in the field of stroke was that we realized that stroke research over the past several decades has been greatly underfunded. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you consider the, the tremendous impact, the tremendous toll that a stroke takes on people around the world in terms of death and disability, the amount that's allocated to it in terms of research and innovation dollars uh, around the world is really quite measly in comparison to, say, uh, diseases that we uh, hear about in the news all the time, like heart attacks or, or cancer. This was something that troubled us as researchers in the field, particularly when thinking about the potential global reach that could be achieved with stroke research, looking at researchers in uh, developing countries, for example, looking at uh, you know lower and middle income countries, looking at researchers in who are uh, really kind of in early stages of their career, and looking at uh, researchers who uh, you know in the past simply d- didn't get much of a shot at doing important research. For example, women, you know, despite the fact that 
half of strokes are women. There, there's, there's still a lot that we need to understand about the risk factors and treatment of stroke in women. And, and so all of these things seem to be related in some ways to um, some of the limitations of kind of our entrenched uh, research stroke, uh, you know, medical research culture, where funding decisions for research are kind of a bit of a siloed process, you know. Uh, the typical patient or member of the public uh, has very little insight into what is going on behind closed doors in terms of the types of scientific ideas that are out there, you know, vying for attention, so to speak, or vying for funding, uh, and what ends up getting chosen. Now, the reality, of course, is that when you want to incorporate the voices of the public or the voices of patients into this kind of complex process, we also need to acknowledge the reality that we can't make everybody in the public a stroke expert overnight, right? It's important to provide kind of guidance and to provide expert insight about, well, what's feasible, what's good quality research, right? And so this is where the concept of dynamic review came about. We said, okay, first of all, rather than have a closed door process for evaluating research ideas, let's put it out in the open so so everybody can see what kind of feedback's coming about about a new research idea that's looking for funding. Secondly, let's also turn that into a conversation. So that's the dynamic part where we say, if a, a group of experts, part of our global scientific review committee, look at the proposals that are submitted on our platform, and they provide feedback and say, well, here's what's working, here's what's not working. Then let's have a conversation where the stroke researcher that put up this proposal or put up this idea for, for funding gets to say, hey, you know, we took, we took your input, here's our perspective on it, here's what we did to change and improve our proposal in response to that. And by making that whole discourse public, what, what could happen then is that members of the public, patients, their families, or even anybody interested in stroke and interested in advancing medical research takes a look at this discourse and is able to understand, hey, is this the kind of project that I can actually get behind and I can get behind with the, with the confidence and trust that it's being carried out in a high caliber and a high quality? So this is the, this is the, the recipe or the uh, behind uh, the dynamic review component. And then the other component that you mentioned in your introduction was precision funding, traditional uh, funding decisions for, for grants and the like, research grants and the like, are happening behind closed doors where a decision to fund a project or not fund a project is uh, uh, made by just a select group of experts, right? But the, the problem that happens then is, uh, like we said, uh, patients and members of the general public aren't able to figure out, well, what's actually going on that could be directly and personally relevant to me that I might take a special interest in, right? And this becomes particularly important for relatively rarer conditions. Because if you think about uh, young strokes, for example, strokes that are affecting people under the age of 55, right? That's relatively rarer than, say, run-of-the-mill stroke. Uh, but that's relevant because the causes of a young stroke are going to be pretty different. And that's going to include some rarer causes, some genetic causes, all of those things, which might require very different targeted treatments. And if you've got a typical kind of funding process going on, then that might not get the 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 attention that it deserves. Because again, there's this closed doors process where uh, funding bodies trying to allocate funds all across the spectrum of medicine. And, and we can then forgive them for potentially ignoring or deprioritizing certain rare conditions. But on the other hand, the fact that a patient and a family is living and dealing with the consequences of this rare condition every day, that's not something that's, that can be ignored by them. That's a huge priority for them. They want to see new treatments and new scientific advancements in that area. And so what, what precision funding, this component of, of, our, of our collaborative platform, aims to connect patients, their family members, their friends, or members of the general public to topics that they are interested in, to research projects that are seeking funding that are kind of personally relevant to them so that you know, they, they'll be then able to engage with that research more and then potentially, here's, the big, here's a big, big idea behind the platform, potentially 
put money into it, right? So so say, well, I like this proposal so much that I'm not just going to upvote it. I'm actually going to contribute uh, as an individual or as as a group towards this this project getting funded and 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 being done, which which otherwise might not happen. Well, and there's there's a lot of Im- important stuff in there to unpack. Uh, so let's talk about uh, some of those things in a little greater detail. I think one of the things that's really uh, important is you, you you talk about the lack of funding for stroke in proportion to the number of people that it impacts with in the US alone obviously we're seeing upwards of 800,000 people experiencing stroke every year up to 20% of them not surviving it uh and with the prevalence of, of COVID-19 infections we're seeing that increase now as well okay. But it's uh, one of my uh, one of the neurologists I've spoken with has also described stroke as the least sexy of the neuro conditions because MS and uh, other conditions like that tend to get a lot more press and a lot more interest, even if not as many people are affected. And, you know, kudos to the folks in the MS advocacy and fundraising space, uh, along with the folks in the breast cancer awareness space and all these other spaces raising funds uh, in a very high profile way that we just don't see happening with with stroke. And I think that's that's a really important shortfall there that in part comes down to some of the branding and some of the marketing around stroke. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, one of the most remarkable things about about stroke that that in fact, uh, you know, few members of the, of, uh, of the public and in fact, sometimes even few members of the healthcare profession might appreciate is that the the entire landscape of stroke treatment has undergone a fundamental transformation over just the last 20 years, and even more so in just the last 10 years, right? It's it's one of those conditions where 20 years ago, people would just get admitted to hospital with a stroke and be seen, you know, the next morning for a bit of a, you know, a sympathetic rounds, if you will, to say, oh, no, you had a stroke. Well, let's figure out what we do with you type of thing, right? And then it went from being that way over the course of 20 years to becoming this one of the most kind of ultra high intensity emergencies, right, where uh, entire stroke teams across provinces and across countries carry out a concerted effort to to try and get a patient to the right hospital as quickly as possible and to do everything we possibly can within you know minutes to hours to try and get the vessel that's blocked causing the stroke or or or, or the bleed that's going on to cause the stroke treated and controlled right it's a fundamental kind of transformation in how this how this uh, condition is being treated and in fact when i started my training 10 years ago as as a budding neurologist at the time all that we had to to potentially treat stroke when people came in for emergencies was a clot busting drug um, uh, that, that we that we'd inject into patients and then hope that it might you know help open up their blood flow and what's happened in, since then is that you know since 2015 2016 there there were several transformative in, again international concerted trials that happened in stroke that brought us a new therapy called endovascular therapy or it's also called thrombectomy where we're now able to go in with a wire through the patient's vessels and pull out this blood clot in addition to using the the previous uh, clot busting medication if needed or if if necessary and then now in patients that have those kinds of clots in in major vessels of their brain we're able to, you know, we have a completely uh, new and highly effective weapon to try and change their outcomes, right? And the reason I wanted to say this story in response to what you said is that this is a kind of condition that if we tell our story right, there are few more inspiring stories than that in the field of medicine. But we've realized now, as, as you've correctly pointed out, that it's important that we get this positive story out there and more importantly also get the story out there about you know enduring challenges that remain in the field of stroke and enduring problems that remain in the field of stroke but at the same time these exciting new ideas and research ideas that are coming up to tackle those same problems and challenges 
you know, the way we've come with uh, with cl- with the clock busting medications, new ones coming to market, expanding the windows, the mechanical thrombectomies, and even using similar approaches to treat aneurysms to help reduce hemorrhagic strokes, treating uh, PFOs in the heart to help prevent other right. strokes. So we've got this tremendous, uh, all of these technologies and techniques that we're seeing that are just the result of so much research and so much study that are producing some really great results now and there's just not nearly enough of that research happening absolutely and then and not just that there's also not uh, there's also a challenge in terms of translating that story like we talked about to the general public and to patients and families so that they're also able to understand what strides are being made and what can be achieved by investing in stroke research right because that's that's on us to get that to get to get that information out there from from the research that's already been done. And that, that, that's also part of what we're trying to do with this platform is we, we're using it as a vehicle to also raise awareness, continuously raise awareness about stroke. And, and mind you, we're, you know, we started with stroke, but we're, we're already moving into other aspects of the neurosciences and hopefully to the rest of medicine. But, but, but stroke was our, was our beachhead very much because of our own kind of personal connections and professional connections to that disease. But, you know, this is, this is the dream that, that, that by engaging members of the public and patients and their families and all that very early on in the process of research where the the research the research project is an idea uh, that's that's being that's being pitched to you know both experts and the public that that we'll be able to get them excited for this whole journey of science that then takes that idea tests it refines it and then results in you know a positive change you know you mentioned covid-19 right earlier on in in our discussion mm-hmm. and and what the pandemic has shown us is that you know it's really on us as a scientific community as a medical community to to get the public uh, not, uh, not only excited, but also really well informed about the whole scientific journey so that they understand, well, why is it that something that was being done five years ago or, you know, five weeks ago, if you're in the middle of a pandemic, might change and res- and, and, and new recommendations might arise as new knowledge and, and new discoveries are made, right? Because that's actually part of the scientific process is this kind of whole dynamic transformative nature over time. And so, so we're hoping that, that a, a platform like this is, is also able to achieve that kind of longer, uh, longer term societal goal. I think one of the things that's interesting, and and I really like this perspective on opening up that conversation, letting the public see more about what's happening and the amazing things that are happening. I mean, mRNA vaccines didn't come out of nowhere. That research was already happening before it became before the COVID-19 pandemic became a great vehicle for bringing that technology more into public awareness. Uh, At the same time, when how do you balance then that need to expose more of the public to what's happening to at the same time, we've seen just this huge rise in all this anti-vax nonsense of people, you know, blaming the COVID vaccines on uh, uh, blaming stroke on the COVID vaccines, which, of course, the research shows doesn't happen. But the more you involve the public in these conversations and the more people start l- getting into this, we start to see some more of these fringe voices now starting to have an outsized placement in the conversation. So how do you balance the need to open this up to the public while at the same time trying to manage some of those fringe and, and dangerous voices? Well, you know, you're you're now asking the the big questions, my friend, about the about, about that, that that pertain really to all of the internet at this point, right? Like, yeah. like, and uh, you know, we look at it in a couple of ways. One is that yes, there, the you have to be careful about content moderation to some extent. Where uh, you know, on a platform like this, it is important that yes, as people are, are are putting comments on, that we're very careful that they're not becoming you know ad hominem pers- uh, personal attacks or or those kinds of commentaries that that don't actually help 
uh, move the field forward or provide, you know, useful critique or constructive criticism or those kinds of things, right? Uh, are we looking for people to to point out fatal or fundamental flaws in ideas that are being proposed? Absolutely. Uh, you know, do we want people to, uh, you know, engage in in kind of the nonsensical behavior that you talked about that uh, that that simply creates noise and doesn't add value? No, right? So so we so we do want to. Uh, have some sort of uh, content moderation that happens, and we're doing we're doing that uh, at, at, right now at a at a very soft level. And in fact, we haven't you know so far we haven't had to really uh, you know restrict people from commenting or ban people or do anything like that just yet, because you know most of the people that are signing on to the platform are people who are interested in research moving forward or are interested in learning. So I think that this kind of platform does fundamentally, you know, attract a certain kind of person, right? Uh, which, which is just great. But but as as things grow and change in the future, this is you know this this aspect of of, of content moderation might be something that we need to think about a bit more and and, uh, and do a bit more of. The other aspect is making sure that you know the whole crowdfunding process, right? Because that's fundamentally what we're talking about here, where members of the public and patients and families and all those can actually put their money down on what they think is a good idea to help it reach its funding goal. The the whole crowdfunding process, when it is unchecked, can lead to really bizarre kinds of things happening, right? I mean, there's a, there's a famous example on on, on Kickstarter, where, where I, a proposal to make a potato salad or something acquired like tens of thousands of dollars, right? Just because of an aberration. <laughs> well, how we try to counter that is really through that whole dynamic review process that we talked about earlier, where it's not uh, just crowdfunding gone wild, so to speak, but it is crowdfunding that is being shepherded and guided by the insights of you know, stroke experts and researchers who can point out, well, hey, here's something that we think is 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 good quality. Here's a kind of a, a, a research group and program that that's kind of entrustable with this with this job, right? You know, so 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 we're hoping that that kind of quality control, right, also helps improve the the results and outcomes of the of the crowdfunding process simply by increasing the quality of information that's available to people, right? Well, well, I think that's really interesting. I, I think that's a when you talk about shepherding that conversation, I think that can be really helpful too, in terms of avoiding some of the cute animal syndrome, where, uh, you know, for example, if we talk about species preservation, you know, just analogously, we know that there's going to be you're going to have a lot more success at imposing regulations to protect pandas and polar bears than you are to right. protect uh, a bug or a small bird that might be critical to the uh, to the ecosystem in a, a way that's much more significant than the panda or polar bear but everybody want everybody wants the adorable pandas and polar bears and th the shepherding can help guide those conversations oh absolutely there's a lot of important success that happens in medicine by standing on the shoulders of giants right by building on in, on previous insights in a, in, a, in, a, in a sustained and meaningful manner and moving the field pro forward that way, right? Not necessarily, not necessarily leaps and bounds, but even the step-by-step -step kind of in, investigation has value. Uh, but, but sometimes that's not uh, as, as appealing or sexy, as you said. And, and, and you know, it, this is not, this is a problem that, that quite frankly, is, is not just unique to these kinds of crowdfunding platforms. It's also a problem that our own kind of national and international uh, research funding bodies struggle with, right? Uh, this is exactly the, tr the, the choice that, that, that you point out. Do we go for so, an idea that's kind of looking really appealing or do we go for kind of something that's tried and true? And in our field of, uh, of thinking about research funding, we talk about this kind of sweet spot that, 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 grant, that grant funding agencies are trying to operate in, right? Which is really, really tricky and difficult to define where you're trying to say, hey, well, which idea is, you know, new enough or shiny enough to kind of look like we're doing something important, but at the same time is low risk, right? And when, when agencies start thinking like that, right? you do end up with the research equivalent of the cute animal problem that you said, right? Where, yes, there's research money being put in towards a certain problem, but, you know, people are kind of sort of, you know, playing it too safe or going with what's popular or, you know, uh, for trying to trying to run run somewhere in between. And it, and it, it ends up, you know, resulting in a lot of 
perverse incentives or, uh, you know, certain kinds of important science and research and certain kinds of scientists in certain places, for example, being disadvantaged, right? And so, so what we're hoping that that the 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 this this whole shepherded crowdfunding process does is that it 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 does kind of help shine the spotlight also on new and upcoming researchers who have new ideas, but at the same time also ideas that that might not immediately get the blessing of a big funding agency, right? So so that much needed seed funding that's simply essential as as rocket fuel to an emerging researcher's uh, research program, for example. This isn't just theoretical because right now of the of the projects that have been submitted to Collaborance, you know, about half of them are actually from uh, early career researchers. Some of those early career researchers are actually people who are still finishing up certain elements of their training. And so these are, these are, you know, young folks who are excited about, about their research ideas and they, they, they're, they're taking their first steps into the field, right? And, and for them to have the benefit of the, the insights and comments from, you know, more established researchers in the field, some of whom, you know, they might be looking up to, right? Is that, that itself has, has some value in building them as researchers. But at the same time, for them to learn, well, how do I communicate meaningfully to the general public about my findings and about, uh, and about my idea, right? So that it can, it can both impart information and generate and sustain interest, right? To, to help me reach my funding goal. We think that these are, important parts of of kind of uh, the the service element of our of our platform as well in the long term then uh, how this might benefit the overall scientific process well hopefully this whole platform helps us build better scientists as well who become better trained at thinking through the questions that they have at generating the ideas and followed by the experimental designs that they need to to you know to execute those ideas and uh, remembering all the while that they have this ongoing responsibility to the public and to patients and to their families. Uh, and so, so they need to be proficient in, in communicating what they're doing rather than, you know, just, just, just talking to their peers. Well, I think that's, that's a really interesting aspect of this is that uh, while the universities and the education programs can train people on science, it's giving folks the opportunity to hone their communication skills at the same time in putting their research out there. The other thing I think is really interesting is looking over the site, uh, we typically think about a lot of these research studies, especially when you're enrolling, you know, hundreds of people at sites across the the, con the country is millions of dollars going into any of these studies, but a lot of these projects are in the uh, four-figure or low five-figure range for, for budget asks. I mean, when we compare to what we think of as, you know, the big headline-making studies, which are, you know, costing millions, these are, uh, you know, pocket change relative to that. But when you start looking at some of these smaller scale studies, that $4,000 of funding, that $15,000 of funding can make a big difference in some of that early research that could then ultimately feed into bigger projects down the road. Oh, absolutely, and 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 of course, this is the, the part of the part of what you're seeing. There is also the 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 effect of 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 uh, you know the our platform being in its early days as well, right? So so of course, the 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 best kind of project for people to put on a platform of this nature would be projects that aren't you know a huge ask because it, it makes more sense to uh, for projects to go on a platform like this that are kind of at more formative stages, right? Especially when we were when we were starting out, this was this was important to kind of get projects that were at formative stages. So part of what you're seeing is is of course kind of an artifact of that, right? That that we're we're, we're an early stage platform. But one of the interesting the things that we're building towards right now is how do we take some of these kinds of uh, well thought out uh, medium range funding types of projects and move them to the next level where they can actually become a much bigger study but not just not just for the sake of 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 you know spending money but to spend money in 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 a way that is that is uh, that, that that takes the idea to the next level right so for example we've got uh, some projects on the platform now that are you know single center study that are being done at one hospital for like you said four or five figures and they'll generate some important data 
But by nature of this process, the researchers at that center would have connected to experts around the world who've commented on their work, but also through the community that's operating on Collaborance, they likely find, you know, five or six other people in very different parts of the world who are also interested in this question and who are also interested in gathering that kind of data at their centers. So now you've also interestingly built scientific momentum and facilitated collaboration. So this is the next level that we're moving towards as a platform is, is, is this concept of working groups. So there's a section on the on, on, on the Collaborance website now called Working Groups, where people can look at, you know, different ideas that have come up or, or post their own ideas into these uh, almost a discussion forum of sorts uh, and bring together teams of researchers who are interested in the question from around the world to talk about it, to, you know, design perhaps collaboratively a research project that they then post back on Collaborance perhaps to raise money on Collaborance for it. So the, right now we've already got a good half dozen working groups that are thriving on Collaborance. We're pretty excited to see what kind of research projects and ideas are generated or, you know, just facilitated and propelled to the next level because of that working group function. And that's a really interesting aspect, too, then, of bringing all that together and opening up that uh, network uh, essentially becomes a, a, a sort of social network for researchers in a particular area. Uh, that might not have grown up through other traditional channels just by people having the opportunity to actively browse proposed studies and proposed research. One of the uh, projects that's been uh, put up on uh, on the Collaborance website is a rehabilitation project uh, that's looking at a rehab, a stroke rehab app being built in India. This is a really exciting idea for for the for the researchers there that are working on it, uh, because the, the Indian stroke system is uh, still struggling uh, to coordinate, you know, rehab efforts uh, at a large scale the way that uh, we've we're still working on in in Canada and the United States, for example. And so a lot of the rehab is done at home with the support of families. And so having an app that kind of provides guidance and coaching to patients and their families is, is, is a really exciting idea in India. But if you really think about it, it's also a really exciting idea for, for us in Canada, in the United States, in the UK, and other parts of the world too, because many patients uh, describe uh, you know, feeling like they've been dropped like a hot potato once they've left the stroke hospitals, even here, right? They go back home and they think, well, my rehab, my hospital rehab is done. Now what? This really interesting idea that's been posted on our platform, this fundraising money that's from India, you know, by, 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 by helping them succeed, by helping our colleagues there succeed, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to also build collaborations that then result in, you know, different varieties of this work happening, you know, internationally. So that's, that's, that's something that, that, uh, that I find quite exciting. Oh, very, very much so. Uh, and yeah, and that's one of those interesting studies. Just looking at the homepage right now, I see that uh, that particular study is looking for one hundred and twenty six thousand dollars. There's other studies on there looking for four thousand for two thousand for two hundred and fifty bucks. If you want to uh, contribute to uh, heparin in flush fluids during uh, EVT. Uh, that's and, right. And so there's some really, really interesting things out there and exposing that to the border community is certainly, certainly, uh, certainly useful. And when you think about this as a research marketplace at the end of the day, right, it's kind of interesting to see that range, right? That range in, yeah, and, and to help patient, uh, people understand that, yeah, this is, like you said, this is the length and breadth of research. Do you have any insight at this point into uh, sort of the profile of the backers? Are a lot of the people backing these, re these projects uh, already in the research field, or are you seeing a lot of, for lack of a better term, civilians, uh, ordinary people uh, backing research projects? It's an excellent question. And in fact, uh, my, my answer to that will be to stay tuned because what we're doing um, at this, this in the coming months is that we're actually going to be taking a very close look at all the data that we've gathered in our first several months of operation to try and break this down into, you know, what are the, exactly what he said, what, is, what, are, what are the user profiles? And, and, and that, that's also going to help us understand how we can better serve our user, our user base and our user community by, you know, by doing 
by doing a better job at the whole precision funding approach, right? Making sure that where we are actually connecting people to ideas that they're passionate about and, and helping them engage better with, with projects that they're, that they're looking at or, or interacting with. When uh, folks do back a project or contribute to it, uh, do, what do they, what, what do they get from that? I mean, are there rewards like there are with Kickstarter or some of these other apps or is it just, uh, or just is it the, uh, the, the knowledge that they are helping to support and have a voice in, uh, in, in the advancement of science? The way that it is right now is that uh, when a project uh, posted on Collaborance reaches its funding goal, so all of these donors have, have donated and, and it's reached or surpassed its funding goal, then at that point, we say, okay, well, the project's now eligible to actually receive these funds. And it's only then that the people that, that donated actually get charged, right? So when, when, they, when they get charged, they know, oh, yeah, that project that I was supporting reached its funding goal. So it's actually, it, it's reached its feasibility target. So it's going to be done. The, the expectation that we, we now have of our researchers is that they will provide a lay language summary of uh, what they achieved and their major findings once this project is wrapped up. Because we think that, that is, that's an important part of giving back to those that, that have supported the research is to say, well, here's actually what was found thanks to you know, your generosity. And here's what it means for you at a, at a level that's not jargony, that's, that's, that's clear and easy to understand. So this is, this is, the, this is where we're starting. In the future, we, we might see that evolving in different ways where perhaps, you know, there's more that there's a, a seminar or a webinar or something that these researchers give through the platform, right? There, there might be uh, other ways of, of engaging meaningfully with the, with the donor base and the user base. And we're also trying to, to discover what, what is meaningful to the users and the donors by actually having frank interviews with, with a few of them. There's a research study that we're, that's being led by the Collaborance team called Perspect. And, and this Perspect study is really just trying to understand literally the perspectives of not only researchers, but also members of the public and philanthropists and other donors to see, well, what, how can we meaningfully appreciate their efforts in, in supporting this kind of science. And we think that those insights uh, from this platform will also, in the end, also uh, help improve the, the, the quality of, of funding processes that are happening in established funding bodies, like CIHR, like the National Institutes of Health, like the MRC in the UK, these kinds of bodies. Because like, like, you, like you've said a couple of times in this conversation, you know, these are kind of the big questions in research and research funding. And by us working and uh, on on one piece of that, we're hoping that eventually, you know, uh, uh, all the players in this field will be able to benefit. As we understand uh, the contributors more, what interests people, and get uh, a greater pool of research that we can then expand on or even produce results today. So, as we're going through all this, how does then Collavidence, uh make money or generate revenue? The way that uh, we'll we'll be generating revenue in the long term is by holding a a small percentage of the the, the funding pool that's that's given to a particular project. So similar to what other crowdfunding platforms do, you know, there'll be uh, really a single digit per percentage that's held back by collaborators to say, okay, well, this is to help cover our operations cost and to help you know grow our program. At this point, because we're really excited to and keen to to get more proposals and to get more engagement on the platform, we've actually waived that. So uh, that that's uh, hopefully something that's exciting to your listeners. That that you know for the for the next uh, several months, where where we're hoping that that uh, this will encourage uh, uh, more people to post their uh, projects on this on this new platform and encourage users to donate to this platform, knowing that, you know, for now, actually, every single dollar that you're putting towards the project is going to go to that project. But uh, up front, I can tell you that eventually, that's uh, for, for our sustainability, we will need to take a portion. Going forward, is Collaborance then uh, viewed long term? And of course, this could absolutely change pursuing a, a, a nonprofit model or a for profit uh, startup model. Right. So we, we see ourselves in the realm of kind of the social enterprise, right, where we are for profit, but we are for profit 
with uh, you know a broader societal purpose. That kind of vision is also one that's been supported by some of the very same funding bodies that we've been talking about during the course of this conversation. So actually, Collaborance has received grant funding from uh, a few different organizations. The uh, most recent one uh, was uh, from Panmure House. And Panmure House, uh, which may not be familiar to many uh, listeners, Panmure House is the, uh, this house in Scotland where Adam Smith, the, the founder of, of, of economics, actually lived for, uh, for a great part of his life. And the Panmure House Prize is an economics, traditionally an economics research prize that's given for, you know, ideas that, that might be kind of transformative in the marketplace and might help uh, sustain, you know, long-term innovation and long-term investment. And, uh, and so, so they're, they're also one of our supporters. Uh, we've got in-kind support from the World Stroke Organization and the European Stroke Organization and funding as well from the Phillips Foundation Microvention uh, which is which is one of one of the uh, stroke device manufacturers. We've got a few different uh, backers here that are helping us, and importantly for Canada, we've got the Kremble Foundation that's also offered as a research grant to help us move our our work forward. So it's certainly a very interesting platform to see how this evolves, and it's a way for all of us to become more involved in this research that can potentially down the road change our lives and the lives of people we care about and lives of other people within our community. So, I mean, how did, how did you come to be involved with uh, Collaborance? Well, Bill, I always find myself in the most interesting of places, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing how that happens? Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 the idea for this, uh, uh, platform had been kicking around the head of, uh, uh the, the, the president and, uh, of the, uh, company, Dr. Mayan Goyal, uh, for, for a while. And, and, uh, he's, he's been, uh, a real important, uh, visionary in the field of, of stroke research. And in fact, uh, played a key role in bringing, uh, the, the treat, the stroke treatment we talked about before, thrombectomy to the forefront of, of stroke care. He had been thinking about this uh, idea for a while, and he and I uh, have been collaborating for a very long time now, in nearly nearly ten years or so. So we we you know we end up uh, uh, we end up having uh, meaningful and deep conversations about these topics. W once I heard the idea, I was I was hooked, and uh, and here we are. Looking at the number of people who are involved in this organization, a, a lot of the times when we look at different companies, we see a lot of folks with a, you know, the marketing or, or sales background. And hey, I'm not throwing any shade there. I'm just a, I'm just a marketing guy who knows way more about neurology and neuroplasticity <laughs> than any marketing guy should ever know. But I mean, these are my people. Uh, but when yeah, I look yeah. at, look at the board, uh, the folks involved in this organization in, uh, Collaborance, I see a whole bunch of practicing neurologists and researchers who are, who are involved in, in the organization. And that's, and, th and that's certainly different from what we see in a lot of startups. That is true, and 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 you know we're we're quite proud of that kind of organic makeup of our uh, of our of our team because it it does reflect kind of our our scientific passions and our passions in caring for patients. That that you know so uh, the a lot of the you know the research members of the team are also like you pointed out practicing physicians. And what's interesting about our CEO, our CEO, Doctor. Rosalie McDonough is is a radiologist specialist. She became so enamored by this idea that she put her uh, radiology training program on hold to actually say, you know, I'm going to come and do this full time and became the CEO of the company that way. So so to me, that's that's really exciting and admirable and just goes to show kind of the, the kind of passion that this that this idea uh, fortunately seems to ignite in people. And we're very grateful to uh, to have, uh, you know, Rosalie leading our team. We've had a uh, uh, other uh, kind of scientific uh, uh, up-and-comers on the team. Our chief scientific officer, Dr. Johanna Ospel, is uh, you know arguably uh, the top up-and-coming uh, radiology researcher in the world. She's just finished training as a as a radiologist, but has 
uh, already published more in the stroke field than several tenured professors that we know. So, <laughs> so, she, so, so we've got so we've got that kind of passion on the field. We, we're, we're also engaging other members of you know, of the stroke field and uh, of other medical research fields in our scientific advisory committee. But you know. Uh, practically speaking, though, Bill, uh, you know, as 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 we move forward, of course, we're going to have to get input from people who are the likes of you, like you said, you know, the marketing folks and those kinds of things. And and in fact, you know, part of part of what we're using our funding for right now is a big marketing push to to get the word out about this platform and to get uh, to get uh, more people uh, excited about our idea and. Uh, Putting their projects up and, and and supporting the projects that are that are already seeking funds on the platform. So so yeah. So eventually we're going to need more bills and the like on, <laughs> on our team as well. Not just the not just the stroke guys and the research guys. <laughs> and you know, and that's with any successful organization, you've got to have the the right balance of uh, business operations folks and product experts and to everybody who can bring that passion to the field to to make these things uh make these things a success for both uh for for founders for stakeholders and for participants and for the greater world that they are part of and that brings us to our hack of the week but first let's talk about sponsor modus nova modus nova has a solution that can help with hemiparesis and it's based on research that was previously done at MIT. It's about the intersection of repetition and video games. You see, the modus hand and modus foot are AI-controlled, air-powered exoskeletons that help a survivor get in the thousands of repetitions they need that can lead to recovery. They help the survivor do the exercises and motions we need while playing video games. After all, many of us would rather move our wrists up and down while playing a virtual tennis-like game, or another game, than just counting out the reps our therapist told us to do at home. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash modus nova. Use promo code strokecast for 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack of the week. And the example that I have for you Actually relates to a dear a dear friend of mine that that uh, had a stroke while uh, she was in a rural part of of Canada and and when she had this when she had the stroke uh, she uh, had to travel several several hours to 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 by ambulance to to get to a stroke center right and this is a, a geographic reality that's faced by many many in, uh, patients with stroke. Uh, one of the things that she that she told me uh, that ignited a spark within me for some of the kind of research that I do is she said, "Well, gosh, I wish that there was something they could do to me uh, while I was being transported in the ambulance, right, to help save my brain." Because she understood this reality that you know, with stroke, you're losing two million brain cells, you know, a minute, right? And 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 she she felt, gosh, you know, how many millions of brain cells must I have lost? In, in in the time that I was being transported, and and it was this it was this idea that that uh, that really stuck with me, and it has uh, it, it has helped influence some 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 work that I'm doing to try and uh, bring some treatments to uh, to the field. Because at the end of the day, it's also this also helps us, uh, you know, keep our fingers on the pulse of our patients, right? Because sometimes with research, you know, you can get so carried away with 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 your own thoughts and ideas that. That the prior your research priorities might no longer reflect the priorities of the people you're you're supposedly serving, and uh, and this is something you know you mentioned MS earlier, Bill, right? And this is something that's been shown very very nicely in in certain MS studies, is that the while the while the doctors uh, and researchers who are sampled say, oh, our biggest priority is to say you know stop relapses uh, in in MS, the patients will say things like, well, you know, I just wish I had something that would help me walk better. Or I wish I had something that would get rid of all my pain. That's their priority, right? So the priorities of of researchers and patients can sometimes be at odds, and and then part of that relates to this this communication gap that that you know we we should try and bridge. Aravind, if folks want to know more about you and Collavidence and what you're up to, where should they go? Well, www.collavidence.com is the place to go, and uh, we we hope that uh, uh, we'll see many of you. On that side, and, uh, and and we hope that many of you will join us on this journey. And 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 Bill, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to talk to me. 
it's been it's been fantastic uh, listening to you and, uh, and 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 answering your your questions. Well, well, well. Thank you so much for joining us. I think this is a a fascinating space to explore further, and I definitely encourage folks to uh, to check it out, do your due diligence, look at these projects, and uh, figure out how uh, how you want to support and 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 at the very least read more and look into this because this is the stuff that's going to make a difference in the future. You can check out the projects currently looking for funding at collavidence.com. Even if you choose not to contribute, I'd still encourage you to check out the projects and descriptions to see just what some folks consider to be possible research avenues and envision what may be happening in the future. And of course, if you choose to contribute to a project, know that you are having a concrete, direct impact on the future of stroke science. And that's pretty cool. I also want to thank those of you who completed the StrokeCast listener survey. Your insights are super helpful. If you haven't already completed it, please go ahead and visit strokecast.com slash survey. It would really help me out so that I can continue to make the best show possible for all of us in the stroke community. And that's it for this week. Check out collavidence.com to learn more about the platform and check out some of the projects that you could potentially back. You'll find that link in the show notes in the app you're using right now and also at strokecast.com slash crowdfunding research. Share this episode with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash crowdfunding research. Be sure to complete the Strokecast listener survey at strokecast.com slash survey. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.